leaving my child behind. Now I suffer the curse and now I am blind. With all this anger, guilt, and sadness coming to haunt me forever. I can't wait for the cliff at the end of the river. Is this revenge I'm seeking? But the future keeps leering in like a pack of snakes Your sweet little eyes, your little smile is all I remember Those fuzzy memories mess with my temper Justification is killing me, but killing isn't justified What happened to my soul when I'm terrified? It's lingers in my mind and that thought keeps on getting me Magical place where family fun comes to life. Warning. Game Glitch Radio is not liable for any and all injuries, maiming, dismemberment, or, uh, death that results. Do not use this product while pregnant. Suggested age is 5 and up. But hey everybody, welcome back to Game Glitch Radio. This is your host, Kenny, and with me as always is the indestructible, the FUBU. And what you guys just listened to was a song inspired by the game Five Nights at Freddy's 2 called It's Been So Long, a remix that was created by the ever-awesome The Living Tombstone. Go check out his channel on YouTube now. Well, this song here is actually my personal favorite because as a mother, this song is talking about a mother mourning the death of her child, and it's every parent's greatest fear to actually outlive their children, you know? Oh, God, yeah. I couldn't imagine that happening, you know, when I have children one day, so, you know, I mean, it's just a scary thought. Yeah, I mean, I know that the main point of Five Nights at Freddy's, the gameplay, is just jump scares, but if you look deeper into it, it actually gets a lot darker, because it it triggers something more with the parents. You know, it lets them know that you can lose your child anytime, anywhere. You know, especially in the least likely of places like, you know, a pizzeria for kids. You know, I think that's why they don't allow other adults except from parents to uh, come inside a Chuck E. Cheese's. You know, I think yes. that could be one of the main reasons why. But, you know, you're absolutely right. And, uh, well, wait a minute. We did that CCS podcast, so uh, I think a few months ago now, uh, the Five Nights at Freddy's one. You yeah, the, the recording where we just bashed on the game so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we did have some good points about Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and 2. Uh, the story wasn't so strong in them. Well, actually, with Five Nights at Freddy's 2, the story was there. The problem was is that I just played the mobile version, which, you know, while it has the complete gameplay experience, 
it cuts out the it cuts out the uh, cutscenes altogether, which is uh, not good. <laughs> oh, it does. That's not very fun. Yeah, it hey, cuts out. Hey, you should get yourself a real computer. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> the most recent release in the series, Five Nights at Freddy's 3, actually fixed all that. Uh, now, before I go into that, uh, earlier this month, Scott Cawthon actually released Five Nights at Freddy's 3 just by complete, uh, I wouldn't say accident, but just uh, randomly. Yeah, just out of the blue. He didn't give out a release date or anything like that. It's just... It's done. Have fun. Yeah, Scott basically did release this game out of the blue earlier this month. Uh, you know, March 2nd was when he released the full PC version, and then March 7th, you know, a few days later, he released the Android version. Because uh, I had the opportunity to play it earlier today, in fact. I got to the fifth night, and it's so different from Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and 2. Right away, you know, you sort of spot the differences. Uh, between this game and the other ones because there's only one animatronic and that's Springtrap and What's really interesting is that before the game was released there was a lot of speculation on what exactly Springtrap was You know because of course since it's a bunny animatronic people automatically thought oh my god a golden bonnie and uh, They thought that there would be other animatronics as well, but that wasn't the case uh, there actually is only one animatronic that can kill you and the rest of them that appear are just phantoms, uh, jump scares, and nothing more. These phantoms are the result of hallucinations that the security guard has if he doesn't keep up with the vents, you know. Yes, and right away, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the vents because that's another game mechanic that was actually added. And something that I noticed between the three games is that, you know, they actually have different game mechanics each and every time. You know, the first game focused on the doors, you know, keeping up with the doors as well as the cameras. Whereas in the second one, since there were no doors, you had to keep up with the Freddy mask. You know, you had to chase away the some animatronics with the mask as well as wind up the music box to keep the marionette in check. Whereas in this one, you actually have to keep up with the ventilation systems, the audio systems, and the video systems because they'll break down sometimes. So that means that, for example, say that I'm looking at a camera, but then the video feed actually cuts off for everything. You know, I have to go over to the second uh, control panel and actually fix the video uh, by resetting that system in order to see anything. And this actually adds a whole new level of intensity to the game. It does. It's, it's, I don't know, I just really like what they did. With, I really like what Scott did with this game this time because there's like so much more going on. You do, you, you do a whole lot more than just sit there and look left and right. You know? Well, yeah. It still doesn't answer one gripe that we had in the video podcast, which is, you know, why doesn't he just quit after the first <laughs> night? <laughs> why yeah, does what? this guy keep coming back? I was with these guards. They find like the ones who have like little to no reason to live at all. It's like, okay, you're hired. Get in the seat. <laughs> You know, another big improvement over the previous two games, my dear Fubu, is more story. Oh yes, that's much right. more story. See that? See, this is the one thing that I like about the third game, because in the second game, you get a little bit more of the story, but you have to die first. You know, which is the one thing that I don't understand, though. They, you know, the first two games explains what the animatronics will do if they get their hands on you. They'll stuff you into a suit and stuff like that. But we're never told what Springtrap will do if he catches you. You know what? I don't think it needs to. Um, you know, I think that the game sort of leaves it up to your imagination, and that comes from learning, you know, more about Springtrap when you actually beat the game. So, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't beat Five Nights at Freddy's 3 or watched one of the millions of playthroughs yet. <laughs> um, so, surprise, the one and only animatronic that can hurt you is the purple guy. That's what I really like about this, you know? Like, there's actually enough story there where you don't have to really dig that deep. You know, you can actually just find out, like, what happens and why Springtrap is after you. So, you know, there's a motivation. He's a possessed, you know, he's basically a vengeful spirit, you know, of a serial killer. So, of course, he would be after, coming after you, the only living person in the building. Yeah. But you know what, Mel? Uh, we actually ran into some pretty interesting theories. Mm, yes, we did. Yeah, so, you know, let's let's start going through the proceedings. Uh, you know, first of all, Phone Guy. Phone Guy! Let's talk about Phone Guy. I'm so excited for this. All right, because no matter what, everyone is still clinging... Is, they're clinging on to dear life, you know, that Phone Guy is the killer, you know? Right. But here's the thing, though. In the third game, this actually proved his innocence, because let's think about this. 
Bone Guy was killed by all the animatronics, right? Right. And but in the game showed that the animatronics were all destroyed. So ah. how, so how on earth can destroyed animatronics go after Mike after Bone Guy is dead? That's okay. right. That's right. Uh, yeah, because the mini games in between each night uh, take place, you know, in the future after the location in the first game is actually shut down for good. Yeah, it is, because even when you're playing through the uh, minigame in the, uh, the minigame after a night in the third game, yeah, it shows that the place is just completely abandoned, it's all boarded up, and like you said, the layout is the same as in the first game. Exactly. Uh, but all the animatronics are still in one piece until Purple Guy rips the, tears them apart one by one. And this yeah. is how we get the dismembered parts of the animatronics in the third game. Right. Right. So, so it shows that Purple Guy actually ended up outliving Phone Guy, you know, which is really, which is really tragic. <laughs> yeah, it is, and we don't really know who this guy is. You know, we still don't know who the Purple Guy is, but you know what? Uh, I think it's actually better off that way. You know, so while Phone Guy, <laughs> it's funny how you put it. You know, Phone Guy's innocence is proven. You know, he has finally been vindicated. Um, oh, I know. You know, it's actually. You know, like, one of the most frightening elements of horror films and horror games, if done correctly, is that you don't actually know the identity of the killer, you know? So, uh, when you actually think about it, like, in the original John Carpenter's Halloween, with Mike Myers running around, you never see his face. You never actually see what the guy looks like, no. you know? So you never actually know the true identity of who this madman is. So, honestly, I think in a way... Scott is kind of leaving it as where nobody is really supposed to know, you know, who the purple guy is. Oh yeah, there's, of course, the popular the popular theory is that he was one of the, one of the security guards, but I find it weird that we've only seen him dressed as a security guard once, and that was it. I still stand by what I said. The gameplay, the jump scares are terrible, and that's one thing that everybody's mainly focusing on. But what the Five Nights at Freddy's series should be more appreciated is what is actually inside the story itself, you know. It's, yeah. I love it how Scott leaves everything open for interpretation for people to make it as their own. Yeah, and I think that's why there's a big thriving fan base. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes there is. <laughs> but moving away from Five Nights at Freddy's 3, there have been some other interesting developments in the video gaming world just outside of the indie scene. Um, and, then I, and that actually brings us into our next topic of virtual reality. The virtual reality hype would just like suddenly get all built up and stuff like that. Everyone gets all excited about it, and then it just dies eventually. You know, this is how many virtual reality hypes have we had so far? Uh, we've <laughs> had several. We've had who several. Could, who could forget the Virtual Boy? Oh, no, don't talk Every, about the Virtual Boy. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> you know, the advertisement actually, you know tells you everything you need to know about the virtual boy you know that poor child is running away from this monstrous virtual boy because they don't <laughs> want to be anywhere near it <laughs> they should they should just put him they just should have made the virtual boy you know purple <laughs> it's going oh, to affect children like that <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> Focus. Okay, Focus. I'm sorry. Focus. This is a new topic. Virtual, virtual reality. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, but yeah, um, some interesting things are actually happening with virtual reality uh, that we really haven't seen so far. Because yeah, even though there have been some silly, silly crazes, you know, recently, um, such as 3D TVs or the latest innovation in the television world curved TVs uh. yeah like TVs that are actually curved so it looks like I don't know even like I don't even know the appeal of the curved <laughs> TVs like fans fans out there I know you guys know more than we do. Help us out. <laughs> Why is there a curved TV? Yeah, please comment, subscribe, whatever on the bottom. Just please let us know. We, we don't get it. <laughs> it's been so long since I've been to a Best Buy. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, but yeah, honestly, with virtual reality, though, I can definitely see there being a big difference in that the developers of these different headwares, you know, are actually thinking outside of the box. Like, they actually want to try and make it, 
like a really neat experience you know because not only do you have oculus rift or project morpheus but you know steam's recently developed its own vr set i think several other people are developing their own vr sets and uh developers have actually been experimenting and doing some really 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 neat things with them uh for example uh some developers of the oculus rift you know, or some of these other headsets have been actually trying to implement, you know, 3D spatial technology. Uh, the VR headset actually moves, you know, along with your body. So, for example, if I stand up right now because I'm sitting down, you know, in game, it looks like you're actually making that movement as well. Like the VR headset knows that you're moving upwards, you know, not just from side to side, but you're moving up, you know, or down. So you can actually, I don't know, have a lot more freedom of motion in these virtual reality games, you know, instead of using a controller to move everywhere. Yeah, that's, that seems kind of neat, though. Uh, I mean, because, well, technology has, has come quite a long way since the last virtual reality. Oh, yes. Race. I recall reading this somewhere that uh, they were applying this to, uh, to uh, survival horror games as well, trying to make the experience more exhilarating yeah. and terrifying. Yeah, which, which is actually a really good thing, you know, especially with horror games these days. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that would be awesome in a virtual reality headset. I mean, just the possibilities of survival horror, like, that would put you in the experience. I think that the developers are really, really pushing for a more immersive experience. And, you know, when I say immersive, it isn't just, oh, this will be a brand new experience that anybody will enjoy, her, her, but it's just, you know, having your controller rumble. Oh, boy, good for them. But I'm actually reading something, you know, on uh, NPR at the moment where, uh, you know, Epic Games made a virtual reality hobbit experience you know where you take a brief stint you know running around in smog's lair you know just an just as an experiment to see you know how you can immerse yourself in this really rich story and um you know they're actually thinking of ways to have it so that you you yourself are playing the game you know you're not playing a character but it's oh, yeah. you well actually i'm this is actually quite a good thing because uh, I remember watching on the news that they were actually trying to apply this also with uh, military training. You know? Really? Oh yeah. They're trying to get the soldiers into a uh, simulated training session before they right. actually go out and do some real physical training. And it actually makes sense because, you know, we do the same thing with driver's ed. You know? Yeah, we do. You know, we read up and learn about the rules and then they put us in a simulator where, you know, we're pretending to drive and, you know, get the basic facts about the rules and stuff like that. That actually reminds me of the science fiction story, you know, Ender's Game. And I'm wondering if they hadn't, like, you know, taken that simulation idea from that story because, you know, that was from the 1980s before they had such technology to do it. Where, you know, during that story, the way that they train, you know, these uh, children, in the, children in the military, you know, so sadly it's a child soldier story, mm -hmm. uh, is by basically putting them through simulated space battles where they get to command, you know, simulated fleets. Like I said, we've come a very long way with virtual reality, and if you think about it, that, this is actually quite a good thing. Because this time the hype just might actually hold on for a little while longer, you know, until the next big thing. Of course, there's still some kinks to work out, like motion sickness and stuff like that. I think it was Valve that I was reading about that actually solved the problem of motion sickness. Really? You know, uh, Gabe Newell described some virtual reality technologies as, quote, the world's best motion sickness inducers. You know, and I think uh, they're actually developing motion tracking technology uh, that uses lasers to read the position of the virtual reality helmet. And, oh yeah, this was what I was talking about earlier you know it, it uh this is actually called the lighthouse technology so you know that's where people can stand up you know move around and all that stuff and the headset actually follows their movements you know it could be something similar to that uh you know and i think that's really really cool so yeah you're absolutely right i think we actually do see virtual reality moving in an excellent direction you know it's progressing where it can actually become a thing you know, it won't be like the 1990s where it's like, Whoa, check out this sick stuff, dude! Virtual reality! <laughs> but it's really just, you know, pixelated crap, you know, in front of your face. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, we just moved the screen closer to our eyeballs. Excellent. <laughs> brava, brava.
And, uh, you know what? I have no idea when they're actually releasing this stuff, you know, for retail either. As Cave Johnson said, we ain't releasing this stuff until it's damn good and ready. <laughs> that's absolutely right. <laughs> Words of wisdom by Cave Johnson, that's for sure. Woo. Oh, man. Yeah, he was the one that actually said, <laughs> you know, when life gives you lemons, you give those lemons right back. You demand to see life's manager. <laughs> Turn their house down. You know, oh. that, I guess that explains why Freddy Fazbear's burned down, too. Oh, gosh, the combustible lemons. <laughs> yes, the guards have exactly, had enough. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. But unfortunately, it's getting to be that time of day again, so we have to say goodbye. So before we do so, we have another remix to close us out. And this one, my dear foobs, is actually from the game Portal, and was recorded by the Victims of Science. What's the name of the song? The device has been modified. An oldie, but definitely a goodie. So, we hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Game Glitch Radio, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Oh, and welcome to the Enrichment Center. Oh, and welcome to the Enrichment Center. Hello, your specimen has been processed. Hello. Your specimen has been processed. Hello, your specimen has been processed. Hello, and we are now ready to begin the test proper. Congratulations, was it worth it? The only thing you've managed to break so far is my heart. This isn't brave, it's murder. What did I ever do to you? You don't even care, do you? Please proceed into Android Hell. Android Hell. Weighted storage cube destroyed. Weighted storage cube destroyed. Weighted storage cube destroyed. participating in this Aperture Science computer-aided enrichment activity. Goodbye. Goodbye. Are you still there?